All right, what's going on, everyone? So just got back a couple days ago from a short trip to Brussels, where NATO invited eight content creators out to their headquarters for the 75th anniversary ceremony, where they kind of opened up access to a lot of the leaders of the organization to kind of provide an inside look that we could then share with you all. So I solicited questions before going over, have the answers or my answers to eight of those in this video, uh, and I'll link those as chapters in the description below if you want to bounce around. But first, there's a little admin kind of housekeeping context that I think is going to be really important before getting into this video. So first off, of course, it's an absolute honor to be invited. Uh, and I, I felt like it wasn't me, it was us, right? I felt like my job there was representing all of you uh, and, and bringing your perspective, what you might think is important, and then relaying that information via Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Substack, as many ways as possible to either answer questions, provide additional insight, whatever it might be about the organization. I've talked about this in previous videos, but the way they framed this contract, I think was really smart and something that other brands could learn from. There was no content requirement. You could publish one tweet on Twitter and call it a day or nothing at all if you wanted to, or you can publish content nonstop for the next year about the trip to, to NATO. There, there's no requirement as to what you post, how frequently you post, where you post it, anything like that. There's no vetting or approvals of the content. So like nobody at NATO is going to see this before it goes out. Uh, they're my notes that I put together answered in my own words. That also means that none of this is officially coming from NATO, if that makes sense. I don't speak on behalf of NATO. None of the content creators that were out there do. So in turn, I'm probably going to mix some things up and maybe not say things in the same way that NATO would through some of their official channels, which I think is honestly what they're going for. Right Again, kind of bringing it back to, I think this is a good model that other brands could learn from. In terms of compensation, there was no money that changed hands here. The Essentially, what they provided was access. So NATO covered our travel to and from Brussels, as well as our lodging while there. We got some little trinkets like hats, and notepads, and things like that. And they covered most meals. Uh, breakfast was in the hotel. Lunch we had together each day that I was there. And then dinner was together two nights. And then the third night, I was just exhausted and ordered food to the hotel. I don't know if that was covered or not. We'll find out when I uh, submit that expense here in a few days. But that was the, the general gist of the arrangement, if you will. Happy to dive into more details if there's any questions about that. Um, when looking at the questions that I asked, what we didn't ask, and kind of how I approached this, these are professional diplomats, the people that we got to meet with at NATO headquarters. We're not. There was nothing I was going to be able to ask and get like some groundbreaking answer, right? They're in front of cameras, in front of press all day, every day. There wasn't any, you know, aha, gotcha kind of thing. These are these are pros. So we only have so much time in front of these folks, and I want to waste my time asking questions. A couple that I wanted to avoid specific military questions about capabilities, because those are not NATO questions, but for the individual militaries. Right. NATO does not have a fighting force. It's made up of fighting forces of these individual countries. So if you're talking about military capabilities or individual military spending, that's on the individual nations. And we were meeting not necessarily with the representatives from the different nations, but the permanent representatives to NATO. The second thing was I didn't want to ask any questions or dive into anything that's publicly available. You know, things that we've heard Stoltenberg or key NATO leaders talk about over and over and over again for the last few months or even years. I didn't want to waste my time asking a question that we can just look up in a press release. Um, that was, for the most part, it. That was kind of the way I approached it was I wanted to ask questions and get at things that maybe don't get as much coverage, but I still think are important, if that makes sense. So a couple that I want to dive into here. Uh, the first one coming from Matt and actually quite a few others. This was asked a lot across platforms was about the 2% spending gap. So what that's getting at is a requirement of all NATO members is that they spend 2% of their GDP on defense. So it's not that 2% goes to NATO. It's that 2% of each nation's GDP is spent on their own defense. The idea there is that across this alliance, every nation has a capable military force. So there's Good news there, but also an aspect that I, I still feel like needs more clarification that I'll continue to, to try to dig into. So right now, 18 out of 32 allies, this is as of February, so there might have been others that came up, 18 of 32 spend 2% on their GDP. So they meet that requirement. 18 of 32, more than 50%. 
which on the one hand sounds really low, but in uh, 2014, only three allies at that point met their target. So it's a significant jump from three to 18, no doubt. And there's a theme throughout, and I'm working on another video here. This one's going to be all about your questions. I've got another video kind of getting into my general thoughts and kind of some things I noticed while there. But a theme throughout this entire event was that the the best recruiter, the best marketing for NATO in a long time has been Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and it's not even close. Uh, it is the most unifying event for NATO in a long, long time. It has increased defense spending across NATO members by a significant amount. And if we look at you know what happened in 2014, Putin first went into eastern Ukraine and Crimea, and in that time period, we've gone from four to or uh, from three to 18 allied members meeting their 2% G, uh, defense spending threshold. So uh, now the other side of that, that I feel like needs more attention, and we, we should have some follow-ups with NATO, and we made a lot of great introduction, great, uh, great uh, contacts while we were there. So something I want to follow up on is, but what about the ones that aren't? Because this isn't a, a, an option, it's an obligation to be a part of NATO. And that's a big deal that 14 out of 32 are not meeting that requirement. There's no good way to put that. The challenge here is that each one of those circumstances is different. Those defense, those 2% of GDP uh, spending decisions are made at the domestic level. So I don't know why one country would stay below that compared to another. It's all It all has to do with domestic politics. So I'm not smart enough to get into the, the individual dynamics of all those countries and why they're all different and not a, not able, not willing to meet that 2% threshold. My question that, that I'd like to dive into further is what mechanisms does NATO have to kind of force that and say, like, you got to get here? How can, they, how can they push those countries to get to that 2%? Because it's not, you know, again, it's a big jump in the last 10 years, but it was a big jump to 50%. And I feel like we probably should have been past that. So more to come. I'm very interested in that. More to come on, on the 2% aspect. Uh, we should have, I think we have two more events lined up with NATO here in the next few months, and that'll be that'll be top of mind because I think it's I think it's really important, and I think a lot of people are wondering about that. So from Sarah, she asked about uh, how can citizens get involved, internships, jobs, uh, anything like that. So there's a couple aspects here. First off, there's an organization there that is not a part of NATO, but they uh, they do some work with NATO in a sense, like some partnerships called Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. I'll link their website in the description below. Uh, I met with the one of their uh, leaders there at one of the events, and the whole purpose there. Now that that is aimed at recent college graduates, up into people in their mid to late thirties, depending on the country you're in, but just trying to to get more citizens involved in the foreign policy world. On that note, uh, I do know that NATO, I now know that NATO has a pretty strong internship program. There were a lot of young people there, a lot of civilians across NATO, more than I would have expected. It's my first trip out to NATO headquarters. And when I think of NATO, my, all of my interactions while in the service with NATO uh, were with military personnel. And it's a military alliance, but there is a very significant diplomatic arm to this as well. And at the headquarters, especially, uh, I would say it was a lot more civilians than military. And a lot of those civilians were pretty young. So the we had multiple people talk to us about how they started at NATO in the internship program. I'm not entirely clear on the details of that. The interns that we interacted with were graduate students. So I'm not sure if they do anything with undergrad students, you know, between years or, or during uh, the academic year, anything like that. But I think a big takeaway that I, I hope people pick up on here is you don't have to have some extensive military background or honestly even a foreign policy background to work at NATO or for some of the missions involved with NATO. This is a, in a sense, it's a major corporation. And the major corporation is not just, in this case, foreign policy and military. They've got accountants. They have people in marketing. They have social media managers. We met some of those, right? Um, they have human resources. They have everything that any major company would need, NATO needs as well. So if there's any interest in working for an organization like NATO or others, just know those opportunities are out there. You don't have to, you know, come from the, the U.S. State Department or the U.S. military in order to get into an organization like that. 
And kind of in line with that, uh, another question came from a couple people was how is NATO working to pull in younger people to the organization and tap into their thinking? Which I, so first off, I think this trip was part of it. Uh, they've done some things like this in the past, but it, it seems like they're really pushing this initiative to try to tap into audiences that they're not reaching right now. And it's not even so much trying to send out a NATO message, but just make people aware. Like some of the creators on this trip have nothing to do with foreign policy, military, war and conflict at all. But they have large audiences and, and NATO is, you know, for any member state, NATO is an important thing, whether you like it or you don't like it or you're indifferent. So what they're trying to do is just to make more people aware of what this organization is. And I think it personal opinion, I think that's a good thing, right? Knowledge is power, right? So the more people that can be made aware of what this organization does, and then they can make a decision as to whether or not we should be more involved or less. Uh, this is a big initiative right now by NATO. I already mentioned the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy uh, that I'll link in the description below. That's a way that they're trying to pull in kind of younger generations. I will say when you take out like the officials, you know, the, the, the top people from each country or the top folks inside of NATO, the majority of their staff was young was my takeaway. So there's a lot of younger folks running around NATO headquarters that are already being pulled in to that realm. Uh, however, whenever, you know, the camera shots or press briefings, anything like that, it tends to be the, the minister, secretary of state, things like that, that are a little bit older. Uh, the last thing I wanted to bring up here is something that I asked of the NATO press secretary while we were there was about including digital creators into some of their press briefings. So we got to sit in one of the press briefings with that Stoltenberg gave, and he asked, he answered four or five, six questions, something like that, from traditional mainstream news outlets, which is how these organizations tend to run. Um, but I, a, a few months ago, was fortunate enough to get invited by the UK Ministry of Defense to sit in some background briefings that they were giving reporters. And it was, not, it's on the record, but it had to be attributed to like an unnamed defense official. I haven't, it's background. Right, just give some context as to how the UK Ministry of Defense is viewing this was around the war in Ukraine. So I brought that up and said, Can NATO do this? Like if the UK MOD can figure it out, can't NATO do it as well? Where it's an online press briefing, if you will, and instead of taking questions from Reuters, AP, BBC, Fox, CNN, whatever, you're taking questions from digital creators, you know, like myself and others that can ask questions and relay that information to their audience. They seemed uh, like that wasn't a crazy idea. Uh, I'm going to push that further because as happy as I am to have been a part of this and to be able to relay this information, I think it's even better if there's 15, 20, 50 of us with the same level of access um, that you can move between because all of us are going to have a different perspective on what we saw and, and how we took in that information. So from Sea Assault, is NATO adapting to address modern goals like ideologies rather than nations? Yes. So NATO was kind of forced to adapt uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. You think about some of the more pressing issues after the Berlin Wall fell. Um, one of the major things that NATO has been involved in was the global war on terror, right? The only time that Article 5 has been uh, invoked was in response to the 9-11 attacks in the United States. So there's a major component of NATO that has been in the counterterrorism fight for quite a while, which is inherently more like fighting an ideology than a nation state. It's a challenge. I wouldn't say, you know, NATO has the same struggles there as all the rest of us in trying to figure out how to defeat an ideology, but it is a major component. And then we did meet, and I thought this was interesting. We met with, I'm going to butcher his name, I'm sorry, uh, James Apathrai. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Innovation, Hybrid, and Cyber. And we talked about a handful of things here, um, but his focus really is, again, kind of on these these ideologies and different threats necessarily than NATO, than NATO states or than uh, nation states. So a lot of talk about AI and one of the ways that they're addressing AI, not just how can NATO and NATO countries leverage it, but what do we need to be on the lookout for for our adversaries? One of the ways they're doing that is um, they have some sort of fund where that they're, they're, they're investing in private AI companies that are, he was very specific saying that it's not that NATO is going to acquire those technologies, but they're trying to 
um, kind of promote the innovation of dual use technologies, specifically in the AI realm. Although I wouldn't be surprised if that spans into other directions, but essentially dual use meaning that other nations could use it or it might have a commercial application, but it's also something that would be beneficial to NATO in some way, shape, or form. So AI is a major, major focus. He also actually spends a lot of time on climate change. And I was kind of surprised and then not surprised with how they focused on climate change. Uh, it wasn't just the, the change in environment and what do nations need to do in order to affect climate change one way or the other. It was how is climate change going to affect our military posture, right? So if we start to transition to electric vehicles in warfare, what does that mean? What do charging stations need to be on the battlefield? And how do, you know, right now we've got the, the NATO-specific ammunition, so one country can fire another country's ammunition. That has to be adapted to chargers if we move to electric vehicles in war. Um, how does, uh, you know, melting ice caps in some places affect the military posture of submarine forces around the world? Like, that aspect. So a very military-centric focus of how does climate change affect NATO, member states, and threats around the world. From Etonius, does NATO view the world polarizing away from NATO influence as increasing the risk of conflict? I don't think they view the world as polarizing away from NATO influence, and I'm not so sure I do either. Um, and I always said the same before this trip. NATO's grown pretty significantly in recent years. There's more countries asking to come into NATO. Now, NATO is pretty pretty focused on Europe, pretty focused on Russia. They do have initiatives where they're trying to figure out how to better incorporate partners from Asia Pacific, like um, you know Australia, South Korea, Japan. But the, the primary focus for NATO is in Europe. And in Europe, the alliance has grown quite a bit in recent years. So when we say the world polarizing away from NATO influence, um, maybe in some areas, South America, maybe portions of Asia, but or maybe Africa even, but um, I don't think that's necessarily new. And when you look at the NATO focus area in Europe, I would say that it's, if anything, a lot of these countries, uh, the ones that are in NATO and the ones trying to get into NATO, it's a stronger bond there than there has been maybe ever. So it's it's contentious. I know NATO has always been contentious. I don't know that I would necessarily say that the world is any more polarized away from NATO right now than it has been in the past. Will NATO allow for long-range weapons to be used by Ukraine to hit Moscow? This is coming from Jeff. So this is much more on the individual countries. This isn't a question for you know Stoltenberg or, or Admiral Bauer or anything like that inside of NATO. They're not the ones laying out those requirements. A lot of what NATO is doing when it comes to the arming and equipping of Ukraine is um, providing estimates of what Ukraine needs and kind of serving as, as the middleman in some senses, coordinating, if you will, what is needed on the battlefield so countries can then go back to their governments. Like the United States comes back to the U.S. government and says, this is, this is what Ukraine needs. And that part of those requirements are provided by NATO, but the requirements of, you know, an ATACMS cannot be used to strike inside of Russia, a requirement like that would be coming from the United States. It would not be coming from NATO. Uh, how will NATO support Ukraine if U.S. aid stops? This is coming from Robert. So there was, it was brought, this was brought up a couple times. We got some pretty diplomatic answers, just like you would expect, um, Nobody wanted to speculate on if aid would stop. Nobody wanted to speculate on future presidential elections. Again, very diplomatic and, and probably the right move from the spot they're in. Uh, they all voiced a lot of optimism, if you will. They were cautious, but they were optimistic. We're confident that the alliance will continue to support Ukraine in the struggle with Russia, things like that. Um, another theme throughout this, however, was the team effort aspect of NATO and of supporting Ukraine. So I don't think that's anything new. I think that's been a talk, a, a focus of their kind of talking points for a long time is it's not, you know, the United States does provide a large chunk, a significant chunk, especially in the military aid to Ukraine. But there are a lot of other countries in NATO that have, since the U.S. funding bill kind of stalled out a few months ago, have stepped up their support. So um, I think your personal opinion, if U.S. aid completely stops, I would expect to see a handful of European countries kind of increase what they're providing, especially in the military realm. Um, but it seems like right now, again, personal opinion, my perspective from this meeting or these meetings 
is that planning is, is most certainly going on behind closed doors, but in the public realm, it's still very much, we're confident this will go through. We know what Ukraine needs. We're going to provide that and then continue to support Ukraine in their fight with Russia. So it's contentious, very much um, on brand talking points, if you will, at this point, which to go back to the very beginning of this video, like to be expected, right? We're not going to hear anything crazy, uh, you know, off the rail type response from professional diplomats that are getting this stuff all the time. And then the last one here uh, from Ubong, I'm sorry, I feel like I probably mispronounced that. If the U.S. leaves, will there be a NATO? Yes, 100%. Um, the collective security agreement is so important. We heard this from multiple ambassadors, ministers throughout the trip. It is a critical component of so many different countries' defense, right? Small countries in Europe that on their own, there, there's not much hope they would have against a country like Russia if they chose to invade. But together, and this is a term we heard over and over and over again, stronger together. Together, it's a significant adversary that Russia would try to take on. There was a stat thrown out a couple times uh, that I feel like would be very hard to dial in if it's exactly correct, but it gives you the right idea. They said that NATO has 50% of the world's manufacturing and 50% of the world's military might. So together, there is no single nation out there that can defeat us. Essentially, we cannot be defeated. Now, kind of, that's, you know, a couple, uh, taking a couple terms and kind of extrapolating that out to something as complex as war. But you kind of get the idea, right? If, if an organization has 50% of the world's military might, it's going to be very hard for any one or even two nations to team up and, and bring them down. So if the United States were to leave, uh, all of those nations would, would still very much be uh, a part of it. And there's some very strong militaries involved there. Right, so the U.S. certainly plays a major role in NATO, um, but if we were to decide that we weren't going to be a part of that anymore, um, the organization would would very much still exist. Now, another note there that I feel like gets glossed over a lot, uh, and maybe something I can dive into more detail with in a later video, is NATO provides a lot of benefit to the U.S. military as well. Uh, you know, the the U.S. military is significant in size, capabilities, spending, all that stuff. But one of the major ways that we're able to influence around the world and project power around the world is through our allies, right? Be it air bases in allied countries, bases in foreign countries where we can forward stage troops, um, uh, the ability to, to refuel ships anywhere around the world, right? So a lot of the U.S. projection of military might is kind of done with the assistance of our allies. Even if it is U.S. forces through and through doing all of the military action, um, the ability to tie in with allies around the world is a significant aspect of that. In uh, in Europe, specifically, and, and somewhat the Middle East, a major reason that we're able to project the power that we can is through NATO, largely. It's the NATO allies that make up Europe. So, you know, if the United States were to leave NATO, I personally, I, I don't think that's on the table that's a really big step. Um, and I think for better or for worse, the establishment, if you will, the blob, I think I've heard it referred to, uh, the State Department and, and the Department of Defense military, as well as the intelligence community, are very entrenched with NATO. This is a significant aspect of U.S. foreign policy. The idea that, you know, it's not overnight we're not going to leave that organization. Um and again, I think there's a lot of benefits provided to the United States via NATO, intelligence sharing and the, the co-location of troops all around the world to project U.S. military might wherever needed. But that'll do it for the NATO Q&A. Again, I'm working on another video right now, kind of my general thoughts, diving into some subjects that were not necessarily asked by you all, but I still feel like were relevant to bring up and that I think you'll probably find interesting. I'll get that in a separate video. I wanted to separate those two. Uh, but again, should be able to hopefully go out to another NATO event, the summit in Washington, D.C. this July. So if there's any follow on questions or additional aspects that come up that you want to know more about, please continue to, you know what, I'll do a, a, a specific ask again right before that trip. But look, hopefully this is a resource to you all. Um, again, it's, it, it's an honor to be included in this group. And I, I truly do feel like it's us being there, not just me. Um, I feel like I'm your your advocate, your 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 person, your representative out there, trying to gather as much information about the organization um, and dig into some of the details that maybe aren't making traditional media. They're not making headlines. Um, so for that, thank you, thank you for being here. Your being here allows me to go do that and and try to relay the information as best as possible. But that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see y'all next time.